our veterans need your support. Foxfield Farm for a Recovery Mission is a not-for-profit organization that has been established to provide an equestrian groundwork training program for U.S. veterans with PTSD and related issues incurred through military service. This curriculum will be offered at absolutely no cost to any veteran participating in the program. This foundation will also incorporate the repurposing of rescue horses and locating new responsible owners. The synergy of the work invested by the veterans to aid the recovery of these horses is equitably therapeutic. Please go to our website to be a supporter, www.foxfieldrecoverymission.org. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. My guest is George Jepson. He's the Attorney General for the State of Connecticut. It's a pleasure to be with you today, George. Great to be back. We have some interesting things, I think, to talk about, bring people up to date on a number of things that you're involved with in your department. And uh, the first one I'd like to just run right into, public educational funding. This is equitable versus equality for public schools K through 12. And this was apparently initiated in 2005 by the Connecticut Coalition for Justice and Education Funding. Take us through a bit of that, what that was about. Yeah, bear with me for a minute because mm -hmm. this is uh, the largest case that my office has ever mm -hmm. dealt with in terms of the demands on the mm -hmm. office. The trial itself uh, lasted five months, the longest trial in Connecticut state history. You're right, it began, I uh, grew out of a Yale, legal law, Yale mm -hmm. law School legal clinic brought together a coalition, an unlikely, in our view, an unlikely coalition of teacher unions, mm -hmm. uh, school superintendents, mayors and first select people. Mm -hmm. And what they, what they wanted, what they te wanted to test in the courts was the adequacy of e education policy in Connecticut, especially with regards to, to money and funding. Mm -hmm. Currently, Connecticut spends about two and a half billion dollars a year on uh, aid to local education with mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of that, you know, 75, 80 percent of it going to the poorest districts. Mm -hmm. uh, what they sought was an increase by, depending on the witness and, and the person who was uh, speaking on behalf of the plaintiffs, an increase of one and a half to two and a half billion dollars mm -hmm. or increasing mm -hmm. the amount being spent uh, by 60 to 100 percent. the average percent. person say this is spreading the wealth a little bit? Is that how you describe it? So it, the, Equalizing. Um, it would be um, level it, playing field. It's our, our contention is that it already is a pretty level mm -hmm. playing field because mm -hmm. that funding formula is skewed so aggressively to the poorest mm -hmm. uh, districts, and so they took and they they tested. Uh, there are two sentences in Connecticut's constitution uh, regarding education. The first sentence says essentially that every child is entitled to a free public mm -hmm. education, uh, both elementary and and. Yes. and uh, secondary education. And the second sentence says that the policies to implement this mm -hmm. education shall be enacted by the Connecticut State Legislature. At the Supreme Court, uh, this is five or six years ago, uh, and the, the, the question kind of was, uh, does that education, implicit in the word uh, free public education, yes. does it have to be a, a, a like a Cadillac education mm -hmm. or a kind of a I Buick see. education? All right. All right. Or a, a beat up jalopy right. education. Right. And again, bear with me on uh, this, but it's important to understand the arch no, overarching framework. I think framework. we need to know all the. the three, of the seven justices, three of them said, well, the Constitution is clear. It's up to the legislature what that, what, what, what's the quality what of the education. What constitutes that? So that's kind of, uh, if the legislature wants to do a Cadillac, they can do mm -hmm. a Cadillac. If they want to do a jalopy, they can do a mm -hmm. jalopy. Three justices said, no, it has to be kind of a high end education. It, mm -hmm. we're, we're assuming a, And what constitutes that? What, what well, do they, they define they, that as they define That would be defined in terms of uh, access to an education where when you graduate from high school you're ready for college or to... Okay, or college to, preparatory or, or, or. courses. Right. Then uh, one justice, Justice Palmer, said, well, I disagree with both of you. It's somewhere in between mm -hmm. and establish what's called a minimally adequate 
yes. education. So the Supreme Court sent the case down to trial court level and with the instructions, okay, tell us what that standard's yes. gonna be and it's, does Connecticut meet that yes. standard? Uh, the trial judge um, ruled, uh, Judge McCowder, and he's a, I've known him for a long time before he was mm -hmm. a judge, he's an extremely bright, capable lawyer and individual and, and the things I might say that uh, in a minute or so that yes. sound like I'm disagreeing with him, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's no, um, and com with complete respect to yes. his, his position and to his abilities. Uh, the first half of his decision, the state agreed mm -hmm. with, with the judge. Uh, he agreed with the state's position, which was that the Palmer standard, that minimally adequate right. standard, right. should be the governing standard in this okay. case, because that was the only thing that the four justices could agree, agree uh, on. a majority could agree right. on. Right. Three of the four went further, but all four, right. four of them right. uh, said it, it has to be at least a minimally adequate yes. education. And then Judge McCowger opined that um, at two and a half billion dollars mm -hmm. a year, the state is meeting its financial yes. obligation. And he pointed to statistics that show that, for example, overall Connecticut students perform mm -hmm. very well nationally. Uh, our teachers are among the highest paid nationally. Mm -hmm. And Connecticut uh, provides aid to education at a, higher, uh, at a higher level than all but one or two mm -hmm. other states. Was there agreement to those benchmarkings that those were the right standards by which to do that? Well, that's going to be the test going oh, okay. forward. All right. uh, so we thought that he could have and should have ended his decision right there because he had answered the Supreme yes. Court's question, which yes. is what's the applicable standard and does Connecticut meet mm -hmm. that standard? Instead, and we agreed with what he said, instead he then pivoted and addressed four significant policy areas okay. where he found that the Connecticut, Connecticut was not doing appropriate things from a constitutional standpoint. Those four areas, uh, and I, as a matter of policy, I'm not in disagreement mm -hmm. necessarily with Mm. Uh, his findings or his viewpoints mm -hmm. as a matter of policy. Uh, those four areas are, he said, in effect, okay, we're not gonna expand the pie. Mm -hmm. Connecticut's always spend, already spending enough money, and even though it spends most of that money, sends it to the poorest districts, it has to go further in, in spending, taking that money to the, the poor districts. Secondly, he said that um, he questioned what we call social promotion mm -hmm. policies in the state. Uh, that's where a third grader is advanced to fourth grade, even though he's, he or she's not reading at a third not grade adequate. standard. Or you get a diploma after 12th grade when you don't really have, haven't met the criteria for what a 12th so grader should do. So everybody gets a trophy, right. no matter what. Third, uh, he, he opined that because, in his judgment, many special ed students really don't benefit mm -hmm. from a, the public education uh, because of the huge expense involved in having yes. them in schools, that, that there are times and situations mm -hmm. where uh, the school the school system no longer mm -hmm. has to place mm -hmm. there, there there are places that would be more appropriate and better uh, yes. for for those spe certain for special, special needs. kids. Okay. Uh, and then finally, he said that um, the teacher evaluation system is not linked to productive outcomes. I was going to ask that question. And yes. and um, and that. There needed to be a clearer connection mm -hmm. between how teachers are evaluated and how they are promoted or, mm -hmm. or get raises. Did, the, did Common Core come in here any, in the mix? It, implicit in that is, is some okay. Common Core discussion. Right. <clears throat> so it, four policy areas where you can agree with them 100% mm -hmm. or 50% mm -hmm. or 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, in our judgment, and again, I'm not saying that reasonable people can't differ over sure. what those policy sure. discussions, how they ought to end up. But in, in the view of our office, we believe that he overreached his constitutional mm -hmm. authority and that the policy-making function is lodged with the legislature and the implementation of those policies. So he was going further than interpretation. He was changing. Right. Okay. And, and, um, and that education policies should be made by the legislative body mm -hmm. and implemented by the, the executive branch and not should be lodged in the hands of a single unelected judge. And, and that's the position we are taking on appeal. Interestingly, even though the, the plaintiffs um, lost on what they were seeking, mm -hmm. which is a huge increase in state aid to education and a, this much higher standard, uh, they also disagree with, depending on mm -hmm. 
-hmm. which part of the coalition you were you represent uh, with with Judge McCauser's mm -hmm. findings. For example, the teacher unions are very unhappy with his his um, aggressively trying to link t yes. teacher valuations yes, with 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 I outcomes. I can understand that. Superintendents and mayors and first mm -hmm. selectmen uh, view um, the social promotion policies sought by Judge McCauser as an unfunded local mandate because, in effect, if you have to hold more kids back, it means that mm -hmm. if it's for every 100 kids in your, your system, mm -hmm. you're now going to have on an annual basis 103, 5, 7, sure. 9 because of the sure. kids that are, that are held, held back. Uh, a lot of folks um, are very unhappy uh, with with um, his decision on the disabled mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and then there's a lot of uh, dissension on whether they should be included in the public schools or separated. Correct, from, yes. correct. And then then um, finally, uh, as I mentioned, right now with mm -hmm. the existing pie, a very high percentage, 75 or 80 percent of the money goes. For example, um, the poorest districts get eight times as much money per capita than the most affluent Okay, so districts. let me just ask you a pointed question. You give them much more money, and what does the much more money go for? Additional teachers, higher paid teachers, expanded school space? Why is there need for more money? Well, it's the position, our position, right. you'd have to ask the proponents of okay. this, that question. We put on uh, an expert witness that mm -hmm. was not contradicted, not challenged mm -hmm. by the plaintiffs uh, who said that spending more money uh, is not going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. That all the studies show that, that the issue isn't spending more money. Connecticut already spends enough mm -hmm. money. Uh, the issue is inputs. When you have children showing up at school who have not been read to by their parents, their sure. vocabulary is haven't even had half, breakfast. Uh, haven't had breakfast. <laughs> uh, that, um, Kids that when they're 15 are showing mm -hmm. up drunk, mm -hmm. uh, w kids who have never seen a computer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that the issue is is mostly poverty, and the inputs that you know, the, mm -hmm. the restrictions that uh, you know uh, that, that happen on mm -hmm. um, uh, upbringing when kids are of poor. Of course, yeah, and, the and so, they came up in. so our position is that spending the more money is is. Mm -hmm. um, not going to be mm -hmm. helpful, but be enormously expensive for, for taxpayers. So that's where we are. We, um, we've appealed the second half of McCauger's decision, mm -hmm. not because he's necessarily wrong on raising these issues. Mm -hmm. It's the but nuances that, of but, the discussion. But that he's, um, he's uh, greatly overstepped his constitutional boundaries. Yes, yes. Now, when is there an anticipation for a timeline on? Yeah, the, we, we now have a briefing schedule where each side Mm -hmm. uh, submits a brief saying that um, you know their view of the mm -hmm. law. Then there'll be an opportunity for reply be briefs, and then their oral, oral argument will be in May of 2017. So I anticipate a decision uh, sometime in the some late summer or fall of 2017. Well, I think the thing is too that taxpayers and people in general looking at a case such <coughs> as this, time is of the essence because the more time that goes by, the more children that are lost in the system, as it were depending on whatever your viewpoint is. It, you know, I guess one wants to see the expediency. That's why I ask about it. Yes, and this, it, I think know? this will move. It, it will certainly, in my judgment, uh, be finished with a decision mm -hmm. in time for the n subsequent legislative yeah. session. Oh, OK. All right. All right, good. Well, we appreciate that kind of rounding that out and fleshing that out, because a lot of people know the subject, but they don't know the ins and outs and yeah. it, where it started and where the status of it is now. All right, let's talk about another. Uh, Situation. Signal. I might add one, one oh, yes, more thing. Oh, yes, please do. Uh, I'm very proud of my office. Uh, mm -hmm. We had five lawyers working on this for the, mm -hmm. the trial portion. And uh, the, for the last three years, the plaintiffs have been represented by a pro bono basis. Mm -hmm. That means for free by yes, a top sir. New York law firm. Wow. Uh, they had 14 lawyers working wow. full time on it. Housed them up here for five months, uh, uh, the f January to May. The lead plaintiff's lawyer, by just coincidence, yeah. small world, was a sweet mate of mine when I oh, was a first year in law student. He, really? he said that they put in more than 70,000 hours of, 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 of work on mm -hmm. that could have been, would have been billable, but they were mm -hmm. doing it for, for mm -hmm. free, plus another million dollars worth of um, uh, just costs, like expert yes. witness costs and housing their, their lawyers. Yes. So it was a big case. That so I'm very proud of my lawyers. That must be recognized yeah. for yeah. Your, team, your team doing that. 
All right, we'll talk about Cigna Anthem proposed merger. Your office and 11 other AG's offices in the Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit to permanently enjoin the proposed merger of these two insurance companies. Just background on that one. Uh, right now there are five national carriers in the health insurance mm -hmm. market. Uh, United, which is the largest, Aetna, um, Anthem, mm -hmm. uh, Humana, and, and Cigna. Mm -hmm. And th th there's a proposed merger between Anthem and Cigna that would create, so you don't have that much competition to begin with mm -hmm. at the national level. These are- Does it become a monopoly when you, you get down to the- It, it, it becomes- It's a conglomerate it, level. It's starting monopoly. heading that direction. <laughs> yes. Five is not a lot of players, no. and this would create a new largest mm -hmm. player, uh, the Anthem, Cigna, and uh, reduce it uh, to four major mm -hmm. players. Meanwhile, as I think you're probably aware, Aetna and Humana yes. have likewise mm -hmm. um, sought a merger. We did not, Connecticut did not oppose that merger um, because Humana has no footprint in Connecticut. Humana has virtually no existence whatsoever in Connecticut, so it would not change the com competitive market. Mm -hmm. That merger would not change the competitive market here in Connecticut. What's your measuring stick on a monopoly? Is it the amount of money that flows through or the amount of the number of Number of, market number of market participants and okay. varies from market to market. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but in Connecticut, all five of the mm -hmm. districts by which we measure healthcare competition uh, would see a substantial loss of competition should okay. that merger go through because both, both Anthem and Cigna mm -hmm. have enormous footprints in Connecticut. Anthem is by and large, the, in most markets, the, dominant, the largest player, Cigna is, is either the second largest or the third largest mm -hmm. in each of those five mm -hmm. markets. And so the combination would make uh, oh, Anthem not the, just, not the just corner. yeah, yeah <laughs> and, and have a, an enormous uh, yeah. bargaining power sure. with, with providers. And so we opposed it on that basis. Mm -hmm. And because, um, uh, in part because Cigna is headquartered here and in mm -hmm. part because uh, Connecticut is, is unique in that all five of its markets would be prejudiced. Uh, they've asked, um, uh, the Justice Department has asked Connecticut to be one of the two co-leads hmm. from the state oh, level, all right. with so California. Cap there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think also we have a department that uh, actually oversees when the companies want to raise rates on people too. And they come back and they say, we need to raise rates by 25, 28%. Yeah. And then there's someone who's a, actually a guard there. dog on that yeah. to, to regulate that. Sometimes they don't allow them to do any, and then sometimes they allow them to do some, but they have to justify their reasons for why they're asking yeah. for it. Yeah. Right. And of course, the more of these strong companies get together, the more leverage they, they have within the market. Have, yes, exactly. Theoretically have. All right. Um, now, there's another really big case people may not be aware of, but Royal Bank of Scotland apparently just settled that one for $120 million. Is that correct? Yeah, once again, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of my, my staff here. Uh, four years ago, we initiated an investigation into the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, for we alleged it was one of the largest players on Wall Street back in the, the lead up to the 08 financial crisis in terms of bundling together um, mortgages, mm -hmm. home residential mortgages okay. into securities yes. and then so they would, they would bundle the mortgages, create mm -hmm. a security and then um, <clears throat> get that security rated by a, um, uh, one of the ratings agencies like Standard & Poor's or Moody's. Yes. And then these, then these uh, securities would be mm -hmm. sold. What we investigated and alleged was that Royal Bank of Scotland did not perform its due diligence that it said it was performing in analyzing mm -hmm. these mortgages. So they would represent to whoever was interested in buying mm -hmm. one of these, mm -hmm. and they, mm -hmm. they 250 mm -hmm. of, of them. The only players in the market who produce more mortgage-backed securities are all defunct, Bear Stearns, yes. Countrywide, and Lehman yes. Brothers. And, yes. and, um, and, and so- the fallout's terrific. The fallout is oh. horrific. It caused the Great Recession. And uh, we, we alleged and sought to prove that they did not do what they said they mm -hmm. were going to do, which is to actually assess the mortgages so that if there's a thousand mortgages in a in a security, was the portfolio yeah, really worth the value they were selling it for? You know, were, were ten of them bad, mm -hmm. or were mm -hmm. two hundred of them mm -hmm. bad? Mm -hmm. And um, so we systematically built the case over the last three mm -hmm. years uh, 
two lawyers in particular, plus a few interns, mm -hmm. uh, working very, very hard. And, and uh, I remember about a year or so ago, they brought their spreadsheet in <laughs> to, right to this office where we are right now and put it out on the table. Yeah. And you can go through yeah. security by security right, right. what the problems were with each one right. and, and the extent to which it was a security that was to toxic because it had such a high percentage of, yeah. of failures or mortgages that were, were going to fail. Chapter 11, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so um, we entered negotiations with RBS um, shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. and it took the a little over a year to reach a deal, but mm -hmm. uh, we reached $120 million mm -hmm. settlement, and it is by far the largest settlement of a standalone mm -hmm. issue, a single kind of the state's suing or investigating mm -hmm. a, a single company, by far the largest settlement in Connecticut's Preventative history. Preventative medicine for, yeah. for, for yeah. people. We, we, and we and certainly attention. there was a learning curve from all those other times with yes. all, all the other issues. Yeah. How, how does something like this, I, I guess, how does it come across your desk? Someone alerts you to it? One of the lawyers sees what's going on. I mean, what's what's the uh, catalyst that somebody you know, goes, it, you know, this is something we have to jump on? Somebody might call us or alert us mm. to something or uh, not infrequently, in, in the case of RBS, mm -hmm. we all knew that in 08 the market collapsed. We all knew that right. residential mortgage-backed securities that were toxic mm -hmm. were the, um, the principal driver mm -hmm. of that. It's not too hard to look at the players and figure out where, right, to, right. where to go and examine right. it. Right. On a similar basis, uh, you know, Connecticut investigated um, Standard & Poor's for mislabeling mm -hmm. those same mortgage-backed securities as AAA when in fact they were junk and uh, we, we led a 20-state coalition also with the Justice Department uh, in, in that investigation. And about a year and a half ago, we settled with, with um, Standard & Poor's for $1.375 billion. Wow. Uh, Connecticut's share was $38 million, which is, um, makes it the second largest after the UBS, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, RBS um, mm -hmm. case, uh, this is the second largest settlement in Connecticut's history. A lot of feathers in the cap for your department, and, and I think that a lot of this is recognized, and we will talk about it before we end our interview today, but um, many things that you're done, and that they're very rewarding, aren't they? Because you impact so many people. Your cases impact so many people. It's not just one company. It's the trickle-down effect of who the clients may be, the associations amongst them, the state as a whole, how that affects our economy, how yeah, it affects it, generations going forward. No, it's an incredibly interesting job. I, it's mm. why Dick Blumenthal stayed here for 20 years because <laughs> the, the challenges never cease. Yeah. One, one amusing anecdote, I, um, in 2010, uh, about 10 days before the election, right. President Clinton came in to, to, um, okay. to um, campaign for the Democratic yes. ticket. Yes. And he had been the uh, Attorney General of Arkansas before mm -hmm. he was governor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when I was introduced as the mm. next Attorney General for mm. Connecticut, he said, uh, Attorney General, best, best job I ever had. You don't have to hire and fire too much. <laughs> you, you don't have to balance the budget. And, yeah. and if you have to say no to somebody, you just blame it on the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is true. That's good. That's a nice yeah. little insight in that. Well, we, we also need to touch on quickly uh, fair trade practices. There were a couple of cases, uh, I think. There was a trial of a Winstead dentist. He was charged with illegal Medicaid billing. There was another one, a pediatric dental provider from Milford and West Haven who had to pay $1.3 million to the state and federal government. Just briefly take us through that. Yeah, the, the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practice Act, uh, that was known mm -hmm. as CUPTA, actually was the basis for our lawsuit against Standard & Poor's. Mm -hmm. So this is a legal tool <coughs> that can cut across all kinds of mm -hmm. uh, delivery of all kinds of services and, and products. In the case of the dentist, uh, what was going on that resulted in our investigation mm -hmm. and a, a fine was that uh, he was using untrained uh, personnel, people who were oh not, not uh, didn't have the requisite training mm. to do things like teeth Quite cleaning and x-rays and things like, like that. Uh, and, um, and so in effect, under the theory, unfair trade practice theory, he was holding out in, um, that, that uh, he was operating under appropriate Connecticut yes. licensure yes. when in fact he was using s substandard uh, help. And, and so that was our legal theory that, that this was an unfair trade practice. Mm. Um, and um, we got that settlement. How many cases like that would come across? Is that a kind of a good a good segment of what you do? What yeah, it, it's um, 
So it seemed to me that a lot of people would fall into that pool. Kind of the, the um, w whether it's, we do a lot of price fixing mm. issues where mm -hmm. businesses conspire to, um, to cheat consumers by artificially mm -hmm. uh, raising or propping up right. prices, and I could give some good examples of that. We have the Unfair Trade Practices mm -hmm. Act where, where again, if, if, you know, if, if you sell t-shirts and you mm. say uh, these t-shirts are 100% mm. cotton when in fact they're 50% polyester, ah. doesn't mean a, it's a bad t-shirt if it's 50% polyester, but you should You're not be allowed to profit from uh, see, a I misrepresentation, a material something. misrepresentation. And so you, you can be forced to disgorge all the profits that you mm. made off of that, that, um, that representation that proves mm -hmm. to be false. That's the theory behind mm -hmm. the Unfair mm -hmm. Trade Practices Act. And then we have what's called the False Claims Act, which is where medical providers, if it's generally mm -hmm. for Medicaid, mm -hmm. bill the government, uh, bill, bill. For people who don't for, even exist, maybe? It could be people who don't exist. Right. It could be, we had one guy who was, if you total up the number of uh, okay. appointments in the day, he was, he was practicing medicine more than 24 hours oh a my. day. Most frequently, it's a little bit more subtle, which is uh, you, somebody comes in and you mm -hmm. examine them and you prescribe mm -hmm. or, or do some one procedure, but instead of stopping there, mm -hmm. you bill, or you upgrade the I procedure gotcha. to a more expensive mm -hmm. one you did not provide, mm -hmm. or you include procedures and that you didn't, didn't provide do. at all. And so that's called a false claims. That the False Claims Act mm -hmm. allows us to go after whether it's psychiatrists or dentists or, or doctors, uh, but all in the context of, of, of defrauding the government. Mm -hmm. This defraud, is this coming from, is this stemming from uh, the fact that greed. Uh, yes, well, there's greed, <laughs> and they feel that they work on minimal costs, and so they've got to pad the bill somehow, somewhere. Yeah, and, and they talk about yeah. cash flow, and they don't get their money soon enough, and so forth. Yeah. So, have you seen an actually an escalation in the, in those issues? Well, um, uh, our powers were expanded two years ago, mm -hmm. and and uh, and we've also been trying to be more systematic, mm -hmm. uh, where. And so I'm not saying that mm. it's more frequently being done, but we are being more aggressive in, Ab in investigating. About you know, they're, they're, um, we're trying to be more data-driven mm. so that if we um, pr provide, um, mm -hmm. in, in investigate and, and find that somebody is an outlier in terms of they're prescribing much mm. more of something mm. than other doctors do, or they're they're uh, doing procedures at a much more frequent yeah. rate. Uh, then we take a closer look. Well, this all leads us to the fact that your department um, has there been an impact uh, budget-wise on your department? We're we're stressed. Uh, we didn't have to lay anybody off. Right. We were, we're able to make the case very effectively mm -hmm. that we bring in far more money than it costs to run. Our office, and um, not just when on big cases like yes. Yes. RBS or or Standard Poor's, yes. but if the state gets sued, for example, with that yes. that education funding case, if we had had to use outside mm -hmm. counsel, the legal fees over the last eleven years would have been in the tens of millions of, of dollars. Well, this this leads us to one big thing. You were just uh, uh, rec we need to recognize the fact that you have been formally elected the uh, president of the National Association of Attorneys General in June 2016, so we have to congratulate well, you thank on you. that. Obviously, the fine team that you've built, the lawyers that you said, the bipartisan uh, support that you get, working with other states, that obviously has led you to that leadership, and we must recognize that. I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm proud that state attorneys general work very well on a bipartisan basis on these national issues. Well, we ran through a lot of things, okay. George, but it was uh, a great pleasure. pleasure to talk to you. Great pleasure to talk to you. I'm going to give the uh, website. It is ct.gov forward slash ag. If you want to see more information. And may I remind you to see us on Facebook, and you can see all of our programs on ctvalleyviews.com. This is Susan Regan. Thank you for joining us and bringing proof to the people.
Today.